Hello, and welcome to the ALA Annual 2021 OCLC Research Update. My name is Rachel Frick, and I'm the Executive Director of the OCLC Research Library Partnership, and I will serve as your host for this session. OCLC Research has one goal, to accelerate and scale library learning, innovation, and collaboration so that our communities can recognize and understand strategic trends, change operational practice, and effectively serve our communities. We do this through convening in order to cultivate a shared understanding and support the actual sharing of that practice and trends through our engagement channels, like the Global and Regional Councils, Web Junction, and the Research Library Partnership. Last year, we prioritized efforts to focus on issues and trends resulting from the global pandemic and the greater societal reckoning happening today. In this session, you'll be hearing about four of these projects. I will be leading us off, giving an update on the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation funded work, Reimagine Descriptive Workflows. I will be followed by my colleagues, Mercy Paracchini and Dale Musselman, who will provide an update on the IMLS funded Digital Stewardship Training Project. Beth Agucha will discuss the partnership with the Legal Services Corporation and our project, Access to Civil Legal Justice. And we will close with Janice Welburn, the Dean of Libraries at Marquette University, and our own Lynn Conaway, who will give us an overview of lessons learned from the new model library. So let's get started. Like so many other organizations, OCLC is reflecting, examining, and taking action in the area of equity, diversity, and inclusion. You can get a broader overview of our work and explore efforts at the link below. We also have an ALA annual on-demand presentation that goes into this work in more detail. I encourage you to view the session, check out the link, but in this session, I'll focus on just one of these efforts, the project Reimagined Descriptive Workflows. Subject analysis, classification, authority control, and cataloging practices all, all part of our naming and labeling processes in bibliographic description. And we have been using obsolete or racist terminology for decades. This terminology can and does undermine the success of our community members and our libraries. These inaccurate and biased descriptions mischaracterize the experiences, memories, and achievements of entire communities, and sometimes render entire communities invisible. Our words matter, and respectful and inclusive description is critical to ensure information seekers can successfully find the information they need. But addressing these issues in bibliographic description is not simple nor easy. We recognize that these are complex issues and that it will take time and more importantly, careful listening to fully understand the many facets of the issues at play. We also recognize that involving the communities that are the objects of these descriptions is a critical component, and it will be a different way of working for many of us. OCLC has a unique position in descriptive workflows. We have the privilege of stewarding WorldCat, and it gives us a compelling interest in understanding how to better advance this important reparative work. We also are a natural convener. So we were really grateful back in February that OCLC was awarded a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to work with the community to convene a diverse group of experts, practitioners, community members in order to examine and learn from localized efforts and determine ways to improve practice, tools, infrastructure, and workflows at scale at a community level. In this project, we have three main components. The first is convening a conversation about how the community can address systemic issues of bias and racial equity within our current collection description infrastructure. The second is to develop a community agenda, which will be a great value in clarifying issues for those who do knowledge work in libraries and archives. It'll help us prioritize areas for attention, provide valuable guidance, 
for national agencies and centers of power in this ecosystem as well help align all of our efforts as we move forward. The third item is establishing a foundation of trust. This is just the beginning of a long road ahead and we need to move at the speed of trust in order to be successful. We believe this project with our three aims will be a significant landmark in repairing the bibliographic infrastructure that we all rely on. We'll be working with the great team at Shift Collective in order to get this work done. At the time of recording this session, we had yet to hold the convening. At the time of broadcast, we will have just completed a virtual convening over three days and over 40 people from the US, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia, as well as other parts of the globe. Our advisory group, which began work in March, along with Shift and others, help shape the agenda, create the attendee list, and facilitate the conversation. This advisory group was mostly made of practitioners and had a broad community representation. After the convening, we will be pulling together the findings and create a community agenda, which we will publish in December. As we develop this community agenda, we will be checking in with executives and decision makers, as well as other key stakeholders in order to broaden this conversation and review and socialize the finding from the virtual convening. We recognize it's important to work with leaders in the field in order to align the findings from the convening with organizational priorities and budget budgetary restrictions. For more information about the project, you can consult the link below, as well as see more frequent updates at the OCLC Research Hanging Together blog. Thank you for your attention and support of this important work. And with that, I will hand the program over to Dale Musselman and Mercy Procaccini. Thank you. Hi, we're here to talk about the Digital Stewardship Training Program. My name is Dale Musselman. I'm Learning Manager at Web Junction. And I'm Mercy Procaccini, Program Officer with the Research Library Partnership. So I'd like to start by giving an overview of the project. So in 2020, working with Washington State University's Center for Digital Scholarship and Curation, OCLC received an IMLS Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian Program grant for this project, which will create a series of self-paced courses based on the CDSC's Tribal Digital Stewardship Cohort Program. These self-paced courses will be designed for staff at Tribal Archives, Libraries, Museums, TOMS, as well as for small public libraries. And the courses will cover the digital stewardship life cycle and community-centered collaborative curation of cultural collections. So the project adapts the original training curriculum for online self-paced delivery, and it expands it so that it also will serve small public libraries. We're currently in the middle of the project and we plan to release the courses being created in early 2022. We'd like to take a few minutes here to show some of the things we've already learned and how we approach a few of the challenges of the project. So a bit more about the original tribal digital stewardship cohort program. This was um, a year-long digital stewardship training for small cohorts of 12 representatives of six tribal archives, libraries, and museums. Um, all aspects of the content and design of the program are centered around the unique cultures and shared needs of the participating TOMS and the individual tribal communities and nations that they represent. The original curriculum covered a range of topics, um, and these included 
aligning and developing policies around collections management, collaborative curation, so working with both other institutions and agencies, as well as with their own communities to define and shape digital collections. Um, this could also be working with partner repositories for digital return of collections, uh, physical and digital preservation, digitization workflows, and importantly, uh, one of the topics was centering community values and priorities when making decisions and uh, policy around collections access. So during the program year, cohort members would travel to Was the Washington State University campus in Pullman, Washington for four one week long training sessions. Additional online instruction sessions were held in the intervening months to continue building skills and providing supplemental tools and materials. The training program was run four times, resulting in four consecutive cohorts. So I wanna highlight uh, some of the unique valued qualities of the original program, which were most commonly identified by the program participants. So over the course of their participation in the program, they, they really built networks of support. They learned from others' expertise. They learned as part of a cohort. They had time and space to work together and exchange ideas. Um, and they built relationships that they could lean on both throughout the program year and beyond. Also important was that CDSC staff were able to support each individual participant's specific work um, through their organizational, tribal, and personal situations. Uh, there was extended and consistent contact. And when participants encountered barriers, CDSC staff and fellow co-participants uh, were available to help. So you'll notice that um, many of the important aspects of the program um, were really aspects of the, the high touch in person uh, model um, of this program. As we noted, um, we are adapting this high touch um, primarily in person program uh, into the original program into um, an online self paced format and our project goals include uh, providing these self-paced online courses free um, it, uh, um, from both the Sustainable Heritage Network site as well as from Web Junction, and also to extend them so that they are inclusive of the needs of the staff at Tom's as well as the needs of staff at small public libraries. So we anticipated some challenges um, and you may have spotted some of those already. Uh, one of the core challenges, one of the key challenges is that, the, that with this original, high person, original in person, highly supportive and collaborative project design, um, that was especially meaningful uh, and important to the participants. Of course, a program with self-paced courses alone will not be able to recreate that experience, and we certainly understand that. But we can serve the digital stewardship training goals, and we can also have strategies to support individual learners and organizations in creating social and collaborative learning environments um, on their own uh, while they're using these courses. The design of the original program was also highly restrictive in its reach. Um, that the intensive cohort nature of, of the model meant that it was only able to serve a small number of trainees and was not sustainable over time. However, the TDSC program curriculum really is uniquely valuable with its focus on culture and community values. Um, and by so by retaining these qualities and continuing to meet the learner where they are, we can extend this learning to many new art many new archives, libraries, and museums, um, and vastly increase the scale of, of the reach. So just to give uh, a, a little about uh, some of, some of the, the training differences in training needs and, and approaches and language, um, just a little comparison between some training needs for the Tom staff versus training needs for small public library staff. Um, 
sometimes uh, these differences are largely around vocabulary, around the words we use, um, but also the ways in which those words um, can highlight actual differences in, in how we're viewing things. So for Toms, uh, it's very clear for them that they're managing, preserving, and caring for the cultural heritage of their community and their, their tribes and nations. Um, so those materials have that very specific and, and, and very important meaning for them. For small public libraries, that's it's very hard to make that assumption. Um, many of the materials that they'll be digitizing uh, comes from you might be com coming from a local history museum or the local history room that might be in the library. Um, they think of it as history as opposed to it, which may or may not be something that's closely tied to them in their present day um, lives and and may or may not uh, be really their represent the culture of the, the staff of the library. Um, both on both sides, it's important. One of the obvious uh, similarities is the limited resources, infrastructure and, and training that's available to them. Um, and, and this is really the core, the, the core set of needs that have kept both of these groups from from engaging in digitization at the rate that um, we one would hope that they they would uh, so the di in Tom's um, we know that each tribe is different if they have different culture they have different governing structures um, the organizations themselves are different there are archives libraries and museums um, not just libraries and so there's a much a much wider variety um, in terms of the needs at the Toms as a group compared to small public libraries, which although there is certainly plenty of variety, um, have a more more of a standard organizational structure um, and, and are more similar to, to one another than the Toms are. Um, also the Toms have an in, you know, and a, a respect of tribal values and histories that they come to this activity with, and they come to uh, working with cultural heritage artifacts with that attitude. Um, that may or may not be, again, an attitude that comes um, along with the public library staff. And even if it, it exists, it, it's not gonna be the same. Um, for the small public library staff, they need to be much more conscious of Things like respect, respecting the culture that may have created the artifacts that they're working with, uh, which may or may not be a culture that they come from. Um, and there's much more likely to be a, a wide variety of sources um, that, that the content, the, the artifacts come from. And also another way that they're, they're different is the way that small public libraries sometimes sit in their communities um, and the history that they have of staying inside of their walls. And for a lot of small publics, it, it really takes a, a conscious effort to break outside of the walls and, and do that re outreach and community engagement that comes much more naturally to many of the tribal archives, libraries, and museums. So, as we, as I mentioned, uh, one of the core goals is to expand the reach and scale, um, and ex and doing that is, is very straightforward. The courses will be made freely available at both Web Junction and the CDSC's Cultural Heritage Network website, um, and then we are also extending the curriculum in places to accommodate different organizations and cultures. We found that in many cases, the learning objectives are the same, but starting points and specific steps to making an organizational change are different. Um, fortunately, so long as we anticipate those, the self-directed, the self-direction built into our learning model allows the learner to identify and select the path that works for their context. And those individual choices a learner makes mirror the choices that their archive might, museum or library might make 
when choosing to create digital collections. This is not a training with a set of rules and highly defined paths that the learner simply follows along by rote. These courses, like the original curriculum, will support the discovery, collaboration, and decision making necessary for real world success in creating meaningful digital collections. Finally, we will promote and support the formation of facilitated group learning for these courses. Facilitated group learning is a model that Web Junction has used successfully for the last several years. We implemented it in the Supercharged Storytimes training program, as well as most recently in the Creating Pathways for Civil Legal Justice courses that you'll be hearing about next. In this model, a group of learners works through one or more online courses together with an identified organizer and facilitator who is neither an instructor nor a subject matter expert. The role of the facilitator in the, in the learning group discussions is to help keep the discussion on track, ensure everyone's allowed the space to participate, and, and do the, the, the basic organization of, of, of creating meetings and getting everyone together at the same time. The, the discussion, however, is, is really guided by the questions and topics provided by a learning guide for the course that we would we provide for the course. In this way, the learners themselves are creating their own social learning environment without the need for a trainer. And finally, one last way that we will encourage community collaboration and relationships, as Dr. Kim Christian highlights here. Um, is by grounding the work that the learners will do in the course in the actual operation of their archive library or museum. So all the tasks and assignments for the course are work that is actually building and stewarding digital collections at their institution. All the quote unquote coursework is real work that needs to be accomplished with colleagues and community members, even if only one person there is actually taking the course. So that's a little bit about what we're doing. Um, as we noted, the courses are coming in early 2022. You can stay tuned uh, around that time. There will be uh, an informational webinar from Web Junction. Um, and you, if you're interested in, in keeping track, you can subscribe to Web Junction's e-newsletter Crossroads, which is where all of our updates will appear. Um, and you can also visit the project page at oc.lc slash digital stewardship. Thank you very much. And uh, stay tuned. Up next is Beth Gucci talking about the Access to Civil Legal Justice Project. Hello. I'd like to tell you how OCLC's Web Junction program has been working with libraries in the U.S. to improve access to civil legal justice for their communities. There is a justice gap in the US. The civil legal needs of too many people, especially those with low incomes, are not being met. Civil law is concerned with the private affairs of citizens. It might be a landlord tenant dispute, a child custody question, a consumer rights issue. Civil legal problems are often complicated and the stakes can be high. For example, losing a job, losing housing, or losing custody. Addressing them can be bewildering and expensive. In the realm of civil legal justice, there is no guarantee of legal representation as there is in the criminal legal system. The justice gap for low-income people is particularly deep and wide. According to a 2017 study by the Legal Services Corporation, or LSC, 71% of low-income U.S. households experienced at least one civil legal problem in the study year, and 86% of those problems went unresolved. Even for those who don't qualify as low income, there are barriers of not recognizing if there is a civil legal issue, not knowing where to seek help, not understanding the complexity of laws, and still not being able to afford a lawyer. OCLC's Web Junction team knew that patrons with civil legal issues often ended up at libraries looking for help. We also knew that with some training and orientation, library staff are well positioned to help close the justice gap. Web Junction collaborated with LSC to design and deliver a national training initiative with the goal to build the skills and confidence of public library staff to strengthen access to civil legal justice through public libraries. 
but we were uncertain if library staff would be interested or motivated. Was the topic too intimidating? We knew that we would need to address the anxiety that can arise when confronted by a patron's legal questions. Patrons' emotions can run high in these interactions, and there is the fear of crossing the line from providing information to giving advice, which is illegal. We were also launching this training initiative at the start of the pandemic, so we waded into these waters with some trepidation. We delivered training in three ways in order to reach as many library staff as possible with the project resources. We delivered it first as a live instructor-led course in the spring of 2020, then translated the curriculum into four self-paced courses available for free in the Web Junction catalog. The third strategy was to train people to facilitate learning groups that would work through the self-paced courses together. These numbers show that to date, we have reached over 1,000 library staff with the training. The interest in enrollments exceeded our initial targets for all three channels. We expect self-paced course enrollments to continue into the future, especially as facilitators organize and lead their learning groups. We worked with an external evaluator to assess the effectiveness of the trainings. Overall, survey results have been consistently positive, even overwhelmingly positive in the words of the evaluators. Prior to taking the courses, 63% of respondents had little to no experience with civil legal topics. After taking the courses, there were significant gains in both knowledge, skills, and in confidence. I'll highlight just a couple of data points. Recognizing the difference between legal advice versus legal information is a critical skill for library staff. 84% of survey respondents agreed or strongly agreed that their ability to recognize the difference had increased. 91% agreed or strongly agreed that their confidence in that ability increased. Being able to identify a patron's specific legal issue through the reference interview process was an important learning objective for the courses. 85% of respondents agreed or strongly agreed that their ability to identify a patron's specific legal issue had increased. 77% agreed or strongly agreed that their confidence in that ability had increased. Our Web Junction team has learned from past trainings how important it is to boost confidence along with learning skills. It's that increase in confidence that translates learning into action at work. Many quotations from the course forums and from the evaluation surveys attest to the effectiveness of the training, but I'll just share one here. I'm sure a lot of people here know what I mean when I say I get nervous any time law questions come up, but now I definitely feel more comfortable giving responses, not answers. This is a great testament to an increase in confidence and understanding of the line between information and advice. Our team gained new insights from this project. There is new awareness of the power of partnerships to help close the justice gap from all sides. It's not just about public librarians discovering who to work with or where to refer pa patrons for help. It's a three-way awareness building between public libraries, law libraries, and legal aid agencies for how all parties can help each other. Law librarians are fabulous partners because they are the bridge between public library staff and legal aid. They have experience in both worlds. Through building a good relationship with LSC, we made a strong case for partnerships between legal aid agencies and public libraries, helping legal aid staffers to see opportunities for working with libraries. We are aware of the vocational awe problem among library staff and the pushback on resiliency narratives, especially with all the stress and turmoil of the pandemic. There are aspects of this training that may actually help address library staff stress. For one, this is reference work, not social work. This training builds on traditional reference and information retrieval skills and provides knowledge to make informed referrals for patrons in need of help so the training enhances capacity rather than draining it. Focus group respondents said that the course empowered them in reaching out and building relationships, as well as reaching out to local organizations to build a network. The training also prepares staff for the strong emotions and stress that patrons often have around their legal issues. 
77% of survey respondents agreed or strongly agreed that their knowledge about how to address patron stress had increased. And a top takeaway for participants was gaining a better understanding of how to interact with patrons both empathetically and professionally. One of our sayings at Web Junction is that learning is not really learning until it's applied. So we like to know how learners have taken their new knowledge and skills and applied them in their job. One learner in particular stands out, Gemma Rose, a librarian at Daytona Beach Regional Library in Florida. All staff at her library were required to take the self-paced civil legal justice courses, so her manager should be applauded as well. But it is Gemma's application of her learning that is impressive. Her library's community has very high needs and minimal tech skills. 90% of library patrons are on benefits. 75% are experiencing homelessness. Gemma created a lib guide building on what she learned in the courses and collecting locally relevant resources for housing assistance, court information, a special focus on veterans, fairs, and much more. Her guide is now used in all 14 branches in her system. Gemma's success story is just one example of the positive impact library staff can have. With a bit of training and confidence building, libraries are key players in advancing civil legal justice for all. You can find the Creating Pathways to Civil Legal Justice courses at oc.lc slash legal dash justice. And I will now turn the program over to Lynn Silipini Conaway, Director of Library Trends and User Research at OCLC Research, and Janice Welburn, Dean of Libraries at Raynor Memorial Library at Marquette University. And they will tell you about the new model library research. Thank you, Betha, and thank you everyone for joining us today. This new model library project is a collaboration between OCLC Research, the Research Library Partnership, and colleagues in OCLC Market Research. As you can see, there are a lot of people who have been involved in this project, and it wouldn't have been possible without them. It is not a surprise to anyone that pandemic was the Merriam-Webster 2020 Word of the Year. The goal of the New Model Library Project was to identify the challenges and opportunities brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. We were interested in how a group of library leaders responded to the pandemic and what new library models might emerge as a result of the social and economic changes brought about or accelerated by the pandemic. What we mean by library model is how libraries function, and what libraries provide. From April 23rd through July 27th, 2020, we interviewed 29 library leaders with representation from libraries around the world. 17 of our interviewees were at institutions in North America, eight in Europe, one in the United Arab Emirates, and three in the Asia Pacific area. Our interviewees came from a variety of library types. 62% were from four-year academic institutions. 10 of these were from research universities, and eight were from four-year colleges or universities. 10% or three were from two-year academic institutions, and 28% were from seven public libraries and one national library. The themes that came up in the interviews fall into three areas of impact, the work experience, the collections experience, and the engagement experience. Based on our interviews, when we think about the work experience in libraries, the new model library focuses on training for the future, making staff well-being a priority, embracing work flexibility, and challenging divisions of labor. Many library leaders have had to reassign staff to different roles or departments to accommodate the sudden shift to virtual and the sudden increase in work in particular library activities. 
Such reassignments often necessitated additional training and or cross-training to get staff prepared, prepared for those duties. And you can see this from this quote on the slide from a four-year college library leader in the U.S. The collections experience addresses the acquisition of digital resources, finding new ways to connect the community to the print collection, and how to prioritize resources that close the digital divide. As you can see from this quote, from an urban public librarian in the US, it's very important for libraries to be able to meet the needs of the vulnerable populations in their communities. The engagement experience addresses partnering and teaching and learning, developing and offering information literacy instruction in an online environment, ways to become a community hub, and collaboration, advocacy, and communication of how the library supports the mission, goals, and strategic plan of the community. As you can see from this quote from a two-year college library leader in the U.S., it's very important for us to create inviting physical spaces for our communities to engage. The pandemic has demonstrated the importance of developing and nurturing relationships within the library and within our communities, as is demonstrated by one of my favorite quotes by Brian Matthews in his 2012 white paper, Think Like a Startup. Brian states, by focusing on relationship building instead of service excellence, Organizations can uncover new needs and be in position to make a stronger impact. We now will hear from my dear friend and colleague, Janice Welburn, Dean of Libraries at Rayner Memorial Library, Marquette University. Janice? Find a way or make one is taken from the Latin phrase that describes one's determination in the face of the impossible. Libraries in communities across the globe are used to working in the face of adversity. Library administrators and grassroots leaders alike are adept in finding ways to overcome obstacles and maintain information access services and shared spaces for their patrons. Much of what has happened in our social world evolves slowly enabling us to make adaptations and adjustments to planning and everyday practices. There are occasions when events in our world, such as wars and pandemics, may cause paradigm shifts for libraries. The COVID-19 pandemic has weighed heavily on community priorities, policies, and institutions. Access to libraries have been governed by the decisions of local, state, and federal public health departments that determine facilities, openings, and closing, social distancing, and the terms of an abundance of caution. They illustrate the fragile nature and vulnerability of libraries and the way that we have designed our services. What we know for sure is that the pandemic has revealed or reopened deep societal scars. Sociologist Charles Tilley would describe such scars as durable inequalities. That is, systematic social inequalities persist across cultures, communities, and people. The types of durable inequalities unmasked by COVID-19 are those that deny a fair chance at education and access to food in everyone's stomach, decent housing, safe neighborhoods, and basic health care. It is no coincidence then that in 2020, society would experience social protests and challenges to social inequality. 
Physical closures of libraries also meant the suspension of physical access to one of society's great equalizers, that being libraries, a place for children to gain exposure to their first books, students to work together, and independent scholars to have unfettered access to knowledge. Libraries are valued as a physical space in their communities, be they campuses, cities, or rural townships. In a world constrained by COVID-19, leaders have had to be proactive. They've created innovative pathways for diverse communities who need information from some sources during lockdown and while sheltering in place. Our clientele have missed the library as a place to be. As we re-emerge, we need to reacquaint ourselves with our user population. As we invite people back into the library, we should take advantage of this moment by rethinking how we utilize space and how we accommodate the diversity of our communities in our spaces. We are not advocating growth or expansion here. Rather, we are talking about tackling this through the reallocation of existing space and making the best use of spaces that we have. We must identify expectations based on what we have learned over the past year, especially in confronting issues of equity. We have to learn that our clientele have missed the library as a place to go. But also there are more that we can do to contribute to their successful uh, endeavors. We have to get our focus on engagement. Engagement by definition is the way in which we express the passion that we feel for our work a passion that drives our desire to provide the best service to our constituencies. There are simple, practical steps that we should follow to demonstrate engagement. One, reacquaint ourselves with our constituents. Find out what they need and want as they come through the COVID-19 pandemic. What are their expectations? How did they function? What do they thirst for? Secondly, using the experiences of our constituents, we can and should use this opportunity to identify and begin to design and build new service models that may be hybrid, much of which can focus on collaborations with existing and new partners. In my environment, this means that we will engage in student success and initiatives that remove obstacles to retention and graduation. According to the National Center for Educational Statistics, nearly 44% of undergraduate students attending not-for-profit colleges and universities graduate in four years and more than 66% graduate in six years. These graduation rates vary by types of institutions and demographics. There are many costs, financial, personal, career, that may contribute to retention and graduation variance. Because educational researchers haven't emphasized the role of libraries in student success, it is incumbent upon us to demonstrate how much we can and do contribute to the success of our students. Our revised models should give priority to collaborations with our existing partners and with new ones, particularly those on our campuses who have common cause in improving student success. Over the past four decades or so, Many libraries have experience with different organizational structures, either in response to economic pressures or to create new models of service. But the past year has made the need to rethink our models of organization and service very real. There are two aspects to this. 
rethinking structures and providing the requisite staff training and development to accomplish new structures. We are suggesting here that traditional models of organizations have siloed our staff and fractured expertise. We are not taking advantage of the diversity that we have in our organization and the advantages we can provide. What we learned this past year is that our traditional structures sometimes hamper our ability to reach organizational capacity. Some of our staff reported to work while others worked from home. Some worked long hours on mundane tasks while others were underutilized. Greater cross-training will lead to better collaboration and possibly dismantling a specialization that um, are divisive and make us less effective in meeting today's needs. At the height of the pandemic, too many of our users wanted exceptions made to our restricted access policies. Others wanted collection items delivered to their cars or sent in mail. We found limitations to our existing service model and had to apply patches to our service model. In addition to getting books from closed stacks and meeting patrons at the curve, we took emergency steps to send clientele books ordered directly from Amazon, loaned microfilm readers to departments and found that limits to broadband access in our communities meant that access delivered to the desktop was not quite there. In some ways, these patches to our services have given us opportunities to begin to look closer at how we might shift the trajectory of our services. This pairs well with a renewed commitment to open content and access to open educational resources, but also an acceleration of our commitment to digital initiatives. Regardless of when societies around the world can turn the corner to the pandemic, information access through libraries may be much more digital. As one library leader who participated in this study put it, so in very real, what, real ways, the situation has forced that to happen. On an operational level, the pandemic has accelerated several library trends, including virtualization, collaboration between libraries and other agencies, and revaluation of physical and virtual spaces. It has also demanded that library leaders find a way to balance the needs and fears of staff and those of their user communities. On the ground, library leaders have had to make many lightning fast, large scale adjustments. As important as this has been to get us through the pandemic, our lessons learned should help us prioritize the value and benefits of communal discernment to evaluate what happened, what we've learned, and what we will put into practice as we move forward. On my campus, we completed a climate survey of our students, faculty, and employees just before the pandemic closed our campus. Even before COVID-19, we found the strong presence of inequalities across our campus especially among our students. The experiences of low-income students, first-generation students, and students of color proved to be significantly different and more discouraging than their majority counterparts. These experiences were made worse by closing the campus and our library, particularly for our international students who weren't able to go home. We have found that some of our students returned home to difficult situations marked by the financial fragility of their parents. They were suddenly dislocated and they felt the pressure to go to work to help their families. 
Different classroom modalities depended on family circumstances. For every story of a student finishing the semester at the family's vacation home, there were those that went to work in their family's small business in place of relatives who suffered from COVID-19. There are at least five key points made in this report that resonate with me. Agility or rethinking organizational structures, even on a short-term basis, including temporary redeployment of staff to places where they are needed. Secondly, adoption of emerging technologies. Third, deciding on short and long-term changes in work arrangements, beginning with rethinking the ideal of an office or workspace. Four, accelerated decisions on the migration from print to digital, recognizing the possibilities of inequalities in digital access. And five, realizing the urgency of interinstitutional cooperation. More people in our environments have a renewed sense of the value of collaboration. So campus partners or community partners become important. In closing, I want to emphasize that relationship building is key. There are very straightforward steps to pursue. Identify the needs of our constituents as a necessary step to refocus. Discern in the company of others by that, I mean, Build partnerships and collaborative relationships with others. Advocate on the behalf of the goals of your constituents. As policies are formed, do more than adapt to change. Become a part of that process. If they are determined outside of your organization, cultivate collaborative relationships with policymakers to avoid the kind of disruptions that adversely affect our clientele. Finally, remember that social inequality has a durability that can only be confronted by equity and service. As we ease our way out of the current pandemic and as we prepare for the next big thing, our partnerships will have a crucial role in sustaining equity-minded service. There are no universal right answers to these questions. We expect that every library set of choices, their new model library will reflect to one degree or another, a blend of the traditional and the new. As we continue to support culturally diverse populations through the current pandemic, it is imperative that the lessons learned are logged and analyzed to prepare not only for the next crisis, but also for everyday practice in our more immediate future. Lynn will now tell us what's next. Lynn? Thank you, Janice, for sharing your experiences and thoughts about your new model library. What's next for this project? OCLC will publish the findings, we will organize discussion groups and conduct virtual focus group interviews with library leaders. We also will organize webinars and offer them publicly. Please go to the OCLC research website. The URL is on this slide and you will find out all of the events and all of our publications. I want to thank you for joining us today for this OCLC research update, and we hope to see you soon.